third year, which is very applied mm. psychology. So even though things stood alone a little bit in your first year, it was very black and white, very know this. In your second year, we start to introduce you to more of a research and exploration of data. In your third year, it's more applied, as well as looking at data, as well as looking at groups of people and how you can actually apply psychological <coughs> concepts to improve certain aspects. Okay? So, enjoy and enjoy today because I know somebody's worked very hard in, in making this as sexy as possible. Is that the right word? I don't think you can no, call it sexy. No, not sexy? Okay. Sexy. All right, then. Uh, usual rubbish, <laughs> register please, as it comes round. Start at the front and then I'll get either that end or that end to keep hold and I'll collect. All right, thank you. Are you staying, Ellie? Yes, I'm staying. Uh, you want to move around and see the screen? Okay, what we'll do is, we've got that to work, which is great. The, um, look at measurement, and the first point on measurement is why. So what I thought we'd start off with, just take some advice from some, a colleague we've been working with just to give his opinion on it, and just set up what's coming next. So take it away, Michael. Just a few short seconds to decide to go down in history. And everyday life is just the same. Standing up to the pressure of the moment is a defining test. Because the psychological skills that inspire these athletes make a difference to you. Can you compete under pressure? Find out. Take the test at bbc.co.uk. So that is the test. And what that's how that sets up. We, we with the BBC, um, I have a project called Can You Compete Under Pressure? It's fronted by Michael Johnson and it's available on bbc.co.uk slash compete. And what, that, what the aim of that does in building the Olympic year is to run a whole series of psychological tests with a view to analysing the research question, Can You Compete Under, under Pressure? Now, from the starting point, is, as we're looking at measurement, it, it makes it vitally important that the measures you take in order to answer that question and have some degree of accuracy. Because if, if, the, if the measures are, are, are poor measures, you'll just, get, you'll just get poor results. So this, in, in, as a starting point to capturing looking at, um, at measurement, my first suggestion outside of this is to visit this website. Simply because the experience for the user is, is, is set up to be very good in that the, there are questions set out um, to which, are, which should be easy to answer and at the end you get a whole, a whole degree of feedback presented from Michael Johnson <coughs> and what you can then question to, you, to yourself and what the purpose of a project such as this is all about is does that information tell me anything about me that I didn't already know? Does it, does it say something about me that I did know? And then that, that might be quite good. That might say that the um, tests that, were, that, were, um, that you reported your answers to have some degree of validity or you know quite a lot about yourself. But they'll be asking your knowledge about yourself about certain different things. You'll be asked to rate your emotions and so on and so forth in different situations. In other words, this is a live test to get some experience of what, um, of what testing is all about. And you get feedback. It's delivered by Michael Johnson. And, all of, and, and you know, what has happened in there is that we've had to write a program, so if you get a high score on this questionnaire, then this immediately kicks in to one way to interpret that. So in, in, so in order to not get the results wrong, um, you have to trust those numbers. Those numbers have to say something that's accurate about the person who's completing it. 
Um, we've had 100,000 people have completed this so far, uh, and the feedback is, is absolutely is massively positive. <coughs> of all the projects I've ever done, this has been the most positive in terms of the end user experience. So as a starting point academically, the website's very good because it explains all the, all the tools and the process that put together. And it's, it's done so for the general public. So it's, you're not going to get tripped up in academic psychobabble too much. And you're not, because it's been written in a way that's, um, that, um, that uh, prevents that to, to a large degree. Um, and so it, it, you get a start, it's a good starting point. So we are, that's our research question today, that's our question of this lecture. All of my sessions I'm going to phrase around trying to answer a question, so at the end of the session we should have some understanding of, um, of how we go about that. The um, lectures, the workshop that follows um, is, is very assignment based. Um, the, what you're doing in your, is in your assignment is you're going to look at some data, that data is something on something called the group environment questionnaire. The data I've given you, so I popped it on Wolf um, late, late last night, is on the group environment questionnaire, and we'll, and we'll go through some of that in a moment. So, the assessment in October, the, um, and so immediately we're starting to understand the processes through which we'll, or the, and skills we need to do to be able to do that very well, and we're starting right now. So the first question, how can you measure what you cannot see, which is the nature, pretty much the nature of psychology. And what Alice was alluding to is the fact that the return button on PowerPoint doesn't work. I have to find some lurky small key in the top corner. And I spent quite a bit of time setting this up to avoid me having to do any fine motor skills when, I'm, when I am um, trying to talk. And the idea, there's a theory, there's the, the idea that you're trying to do fine motor skills when you're not quite in the mindset for fine motor skills makes them extremely problematic, which means I might fluff them a few times, which have the consequence of making me even more annoyed. So there's emotional regulation going on the whole time. This is in essence what, uh, th these are the words of what I, of what, um, I was talking about immediate, a moment ago in terms of how they're written down. If we assess concepts, concepts, concepts that are relevant to our work, then we can develop appropriate interventions. If we assess someone on there, if they are low, high in anxiety, and we think anxiety is something that is relevant to performance, and we want to reduce their anxiety, then we need to know that first measure is going to be valid. If the first measure is not very valid, not very reliable, if reliability means that you're high in anxiety on this questionnaire one day, low in anxiety on the questionnaire another day, we're not sure that we've got a stable score, a reliable score. Something reliable scores the same thing every time, provided, of course, nothing has happened in the, in the interim. A set of scales will be valid if you're 10 stone in the morning 10 stone 10 minutes later, 10, 10 stone 20 minutes later, but you might be less than 10 stone 40 minutes later if you've been for a long run because you'd have lost water through sweat. If the scales don't show that you've known you've sweated, then the test retest reliability of those scales would be questionable. Well, we want psychological measures which have a similar degree of accuracy, or, or best guess accuracy, and the words best guess and estimate will be a re recurring theme of how we look at psychology and the idea of how can we measure what we cannot see because we can't see these concepts very easily. Anxiety, we can't see what's going on in someone's head and we typically assess that through self-report. Oh, go Quick example of what we mean by that. So if we, if we were interested in confidence and performance, what we have here is a perfect relationship. So from our confidence scores, we can predict accurately that we'll get a poor performance score. So two on confidence equals the two on performance, whatever two is in performance. If two is how far you can jump, then um, being more confident would be um, a, would get a better score. Being high in confidence would be an even better score. So if we gave a group of people a questionnaire, and we had those with high in confidence, those with those in low in confidence, if this relationship was true, then we could, we could predict who would, who would um, get the best performance. If we knew that information, we could make a massive amount of money at the bookies, of course, couldn't we? That sort of thing. Because there's a, a direct, there's, in this case, it's, it's a hypothetical, of course, but a direct relationship. A direct and per positive, perfect correlation. The, trick, the difficulty is in psychology is that most of the information is contained in someone's head. And confidence is a good example 
of a variable which is extremely problematic to assess with great accuracy. Because if we, ask, if we ask someone, how confident are you before, if we ask Stephen Gerrard, European Championship, how confident are you about scoring the penalty? If we ask him immediately beforehand, he is not, he's, he's going to, he is unlikely to give an answer that's anything but high in confidence. Because if, he, if you get if a score of 2 out of 10, which might be how your true res result, and you say that to yourself, and the act of asking someone means that you tell it in, in public, so you're telling a statement about yourself, as yourself, then you might start believing that you're very low in self-confidence. And people, people intuitively know that they need to be high in self-confidence to do lots of tasks that involve performing under pressure. So the, the act of asking someone raises their self-awareness of the concepts you're measuring. And then it, they, it makes them question just whether they are prepared to admit to scoring very low scores for self-confidence. When we, when we assess males and females self-confidence, and this is almost, always, always occurs, we get a gender difference. What, what, what direction do you reckon that gender difference is? Males higher or lower? Higher or lower? Males higher. Why do males score? Um, uh, on a scale from 1 to 100, a zero score for a man is what? 50. Zero from it starts at 50, on a zero score. And that's almost all the time, almost every study, rarely do you get a score less than 50. Why is that? I don't, I don't know. Maybe there's a cultural thing regarding not wishing to give yourself less than 50% of a chance. When we look at the relationship between self-confidence and performance between males and females, no difference. No difference whatsoever. In other words, it's roughly the same. So if we get a score of 50 for a man and a score of 50 for a woman for self-confidence, the score of 50 for a man is much lower in proportion to all the other males than the score of 50 is, because there are gender differences going on. So it's important to understand, be aware that that there will be errors built into why that is the case. We don't know, by the way, we don't really know why there are gender differences between males and females. We know there are cultural differences, just by the way. We, um, Americans tend to report higher confidence than, than, than um, Eastern countries. The Chinese tend to report lower confidence. Possibly cultural difference where we're presenting yourself very confident is very socially acceptable in America, maybe less so in China. But there are differences, cultural differences, individual differences, that influence the scores in other words, it's not a perfect science. So this is the end. It's a take-home message. Get to it right from the start. Excellent. So our take-home message, before we go into the details of how we construct that, and it's important to make that this, is, is that most, self, most psychological concepts are measured through some degree of self-report. So how confident are you, how nervous are you, how cohesive are you, how happy are you, how thin are you? Most psychological measures, most concepts, to some degree, are measured through self-report. It's a common way of doing it, as there are other ways, but we're not looking at that in, in this part, because um, self-report gives a, a, a means to collecting data which is relatively straightforward. There is validity in self-report, we need to interrogate it so we get the best measures possible. So that's our first point, is that the self-report is commonly used and self-report provides estimates. There is, there is, er, there is error in self-report. And we'll look as to the reasons why that later. We've already hinted at possible one reasons, hinted at maybe gender differences. Uh, we don't quite know why that is the case, but um, we've already hinted that it's not an exact science. Self-report questionnaires typically, almost inevitably, in almost every single one, are used by adding up the items for each factor. So if you get a self-confidence questionnaire, there'll be a number of items. You've got to find out from the test manual what those items are and add them up to get a factor score for self-confidence or group cohesion, task group cohesion. So typically you need to find out how to put the questionnaires put together. But it's only a case of there are ten items and it assesses two factors. Five will probably assess one thing, five will assess the other thing. And once you know that point, and you just add them up together, 
and that gives you your factor score. That's, the, that's pretty much how you work with questionnaires, you add them up. So each item is assessing a different part of the concept, trying to add it up together so it provides, assesses it in overall terms. <coughs> Psychometrically, and, and people who, who um, validate questionnaires argue that the more items you've got, the better, which, which is possibly true, that there's going to be greater reliability if we are trying to assess the anxiety we have how tense are you, how nervous are you, how panicky are you, how anxious are you. And we had 500 different items. If you put the same thing 500 times, you'd reliably put that you're nervous. But practically, who likes completing questionnaires? Someone. Someone likes completing questionnaires. The, an athlete, prior to competition, um, and where you may be doing some study later on, or prior to taking part in exercise, or prior to going out to do some exercise, want to do the activity itself, not take part in your study. So taking part in your study is quite difficult. So if you turn up to someone and say, can you just take part in my study? People are quite obliging and say, oh, okay. Then. And then you out come from your bag, this 40-page document, you'll soon find the other people who have spotted you, and you see, you see this Saturday afternoon on the street where the person turns up with a questionnaire, everyone else is deviating around the side. That's what will happen in your, in your studies and make it very difficult. If you turn up and people complete the questionnaire and they're done in very, very quick time, you have a chance of being able to uh, get larger samples of data. And that's pretty much the fact from uh, most people's experience of working with, um, working with, with, um, uh, with collecting data. It's certainly my experience is the BBC project's 20 minutes, but that's, that is the nature of the BBC project. There are interventions going on in that, there's a lot more to it. You'll see how we have, how we have shortened all the questionnaires as quickly as possible. You'll also see in that how we have tried to make them quite interesting to complete rather than, um, rather than um, the sort of traditional um, tick box way. We'll briefly look today at how to validate a questionnaire, and I say briefly because I put all those in the lecture, but I don't plan to go through them. They're sort of thing in any great, in any great depth, if at all, on the basis that the key point is that you need to know it's a lengthy process, and you'll just see all the different stages that are going on. And then what we're getting into is there's an Excel sheet. It's called Questionnaires and Questionnaire Part of the um, online system. We're looking at the GEQ. We're looking at the group group cohesion. GEQ isn't a great starting point for assessing questionnaires because it has reverse items where you put where one is you have to reverse the score where, where one is twisted the other way around. So it just makes it a bit trickier to try and, to set the Excel sheet up. But where that's all set up for you to look at today, there's a there's work there's there's three sheets on the Excel sheet. One is the questionnaire itself. Second is you've put scores in which scores it and what what you're going to do from that is put some scores into it, and then in the uh, forum, chat room in Wolf, you're going to put some comments down. I've already put some comments. It doesn't have to be too much, but, in it, but what I want for the start of next week is to be looking at 80 or 88 comments, at least, or, of, of your experiences of using the GEQ, what you think about it, is, could it be any good, what are the problems with it, um, and we'll come back to you next week. And group cohesion, as we'll see in a minute, is quite an interesting one to, to start with um, because it's so fundamental. So, we'll look at self-report. This is pretty much how it goes. And let's hopefully this one works. Now, I found this software, which is actually great, for recording the screen. So what should happen now is this video I recorded last night should take us through... Um, simply going to complete a questionnaire just to remind ourselves, this is my computer at home, not quite working out where, what to do, me fundling through. What you've got there, by the way, is the, um, for your ethics, which you'll see, is an informed consent um, form where the person is in agreeing to take part in the study. Um, so there's, there's the description of what's going on, um, and there's the questionnaire. It's very typically, you're putting in, your, you're putting in some responses and then what you've got is a series of questions that are coming down. It's a bit hard to see. Um, it's a bit light. Um, but the... I guess so. We've got that one off, really. That big, um, what looks like a kitchen knife. Oh. Oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. 
So that's an online one, and what you see is oh, I'm whizzing through. This is panicky. Do I feel panicky? And I've got the options here, not at all, a little, moderately, quite a bit, extremely. So I've got five options, lively, confused, worn out, depressed, downhearted, and so on, and so forth. So first, this is the first principle of self-report, um, that you get prompt with a prompt, how do you feel, panicky? And then you're going to put that feeling to a number, or a category, and they'll be numbered zero to four. So if you're confused and say, well, I am a bit confused, what number do I pick, moderately or quite a lot? Well, I'm not sure really, I'm quite confused, what do I put? I've got, so I've got, in other words, you plump for an option, it might be quite a lot, it might be, so you, you have to make a choice. If you're genuinely unsure about how you're feeling, it becomes quite difficult. Um, the systems only give you fixed responses though, don't they? And therefore, you might, there may be, there's the first part where there may be error, you may be genuinely uncertain about how you're feeling and the responses may not be there in order to um, provide you with the most accurate response. Sometimes the more options you give, there are five there, if you had a hundred, you think, oh, well, they're bound to be in hundred. But that, that makes, that sometimes also doesn't make it any easier because if you're genuinely uncertain about what score to give, you've just got more <coughs> options, a greater range to, to focus your uncertainty. And questionnaires, do you, do you feel happy, yes, no, where you've got, a, you've got a, a two options, often provide clearer answers, but they lack the range, because we prompt it, someone will force their response to either one way or the other. So those middle grounds, where you might, some people might be a three, some might be a four, some people just can, can actually uh, mess up the data. Let's just, that worked. So assessing the concept, it's quite dry this stuff, it's quite a dry concept, but in essence this is how we got, you saw that we have a concept called tension. That questionnaire says 24 items assess 6 mood states. Four of those items are tension, and they are anxious, worried, nervous, panicky. So when you, when you, have, when you, when you want to go and use the questionnaire, you need to know what the factors are, and then look through the items as to what, what items to add up and what to do with them. Okay? Straightforward stuff, pretty basic, but it's, it's the skills you, you need to know in order to use a questionnaire. And that you add them up in six mood states. Once you've got your score, it's not so straightforward, is it? Because then you've got a score of, say, 10 for tension. Is that good, bad, average, normal? What does that mean? Um, then, so that, from that, you've then got to make a judgment, which then goes to the literature. Is 10 high or not? For the um, in compared to other people, if comparing to other people is the best way of doing it, um, sometimes it isn't. Um, so what we did here is we did this for a very very direct assessment of emotions. We ran a running workshop last year, which did this, and we got people to rate their emotions for their best performance and their worst performance. This is me playing around my screen capturing software again. And so, how angry, when you performed at your best, how angry were you, how anxious were you, how dejected, how excited, how happy? And you give a score from one to four. And what we've got here, and this is how I think is a good way of setting up the way to interpret questionnaire scores as you go, is, as you can see, as, as the scores are changing, the graph is changing. And we can see that best performance and worst performance vary as a function on the graph are varying by the numbers going. So we can immediately see how that's going in. So we put a new athlete in, and this new athlete is quite angry, performs quite well when they're angry. And you go there. Um, quite well when they're anxious, quite well when they're excited, and quite well when I'm not, I'm not overly happy. With this athlete, you've got someone who's angry, um, angry, angry, anxious, excited, and happy when they're at their best performance. So if they reported that they were quite anxious, then you might not judge that. There's me playing around with it again. So it's a new toy. New toy. You might not um, judge that that's, that's a bad performance for that individual. So that, uh, sometimes when you know what, how the individual's normal score on, you can take that from it. So that once again, we've got subjectivity in the judgments you make and then subjectivity in the interpretations you make. So, from a scientific point of view, it's not giving you a lot, is it, really? It's, giving, it's making it a bit a muddy ground. 
that's worth knowing. That's, that, that, that is vital to your understanding of these estimates, in that the language you use to, to explain self-report is usually quite soft. So the score suggests something. They tend not to demonstrate it. They tend not to be hard facts that the person is actually anxious. They reported that they were anxious. And be soft in terms of your judgment whether this person's scores truly represent themselves or, or tr will truly then have the impact you'd like them to do. So you, you have, so it's a, there's always a degree of caution that you have to go into um, explaining that. If you look at the BBC on the Compete project, you'll, you will hear how we've built in caution to the feedback that's given by Michael. It's really hard facts that are being presented at someone, but there's, there's, edge, there's, there's caution built into the interpretation of those results um, accordingly. And so that's, that's important because these are estimates. And they're estimates. People, aren't, people don't know um, often how they're feeling or the numbers that are given are not precise enough to capture um, <coughs> their thoughts, feelings. And if they, um, um, and as a consequence, they don't represent estimates. But benefits are that people have a rough idea and that there's some use, utility to them. It can be relatively easy to do, and you can use it in situations where, which, which can capture the insight into how people are thinking, feeling, in, in difficult situations. So we had a South Pole explorer who completed a mood diary every day during a South Pole exploration. She did the same for the North Pole, actually, on another study. Um, and a very, very simple 30-second mood diary provides a set of scores which allows you to understand the sorts of variations that go on with, with quite a new, unique, um, piece, a, a, new, a unique experience. So they offer ways of getting inside, but that's not the only way of doing it, of course. That is one way of doing it. Uh, and they, um, they offer things where, where brevity is important. Now, that chapter is one I've given you in the... I've given, it's a great chapter. It's not, it's not great because I wrote it. It's great in terms that it, it's quite user-friendly in terms of it. It sets... Can, where, how can you use um, self-report tests in situations <coughs> you haven't got much time, which is sport, which is before exercise, which is before, before anything that's relatively important, which is mostly where sport and exercise psychologists tend to operate. Excuse me, what does that mean? Sure, quick, quick to do, yeah, quick to do. Um, where, where you'd be working, yeah. The limitations, and there is a um, great, paper, great article um, from the 1970s by Nesbitt and Wilson, and if you can read, you can get it on Google, which is quite a good way of getting it, called Telling More Than You Can Know, uh, which the title says it all really, in other words, that people only provide best guesses, can be genuinely unclear, or may not want to report how they feel, and that may not be because they want to, they, that may not because they don't want to give you the answer to ruin your study, but, but, if you know that you want to feel in a certain way and you're not feeling in a certain way, admitting it may not help you repair how you're feeling. So the act of saying, yeah, I feel fine, might be an actual statement to say, I would like to be feeling fine. I feel, yeah, I feel, do you feel confident? Yeah, I feel confident. I'd like to be feeling confident. So the act of saying it to someone else, whether that's in a self-report form on a questionnaire or it's in asked verbally, that act of, of, in, of engagement with someone is part of the person's self-regulation of how they're possibly wanting to change how they're feeling. Um, rarely to, would someone say before doing something important where they knew they wanted to be, be feeling at their best, how do you feel? I feel terrible, I'm going to perform really dreadfully. Um, when the performance is really important to them. But it is interesting, when you start, when you start on, on, I do running race, you go on the start of the running race, and you hear people's expectations be managed and manipulated, change as they start. They go, yeah, I was going to go, but I've got a bit of a hamstring pull today. And you just think, why don't you just stop talking? Because what you're saying is so negative, that you're, you must be talking yourself out of whatever you, you, of any possibility of you performing reasonably well today. 
uh, and everyone else is getting that as well. So there can, there, there can be, we can hear people talking quite negatively, um, but it's, it is a regulatory process, and asking them the question can, can change the very concept you're trying to assess. How nervous are you? Oh, I am very nervous. Didn't realise I was nervous. Oh, that's... and the person realises that they don't want to feel like that, and immediately starts to engage in um, self-regulate, self-regulatory behaviour, thoughts to change how they're feeling. Uh, and that may not be conscious as well. People um, uh, op- have a, operate in a non-conscious level to start doing things without even realising it occasions. We get to the dry stuff. Remember, all that Andy's doing as well is setting the context, not only for your first assignment, but then for your second, when you have to look at the strengths and weaknesses on both uh, quantitative and qualitative or particular tools like questionnaires. So, so those of you really who look at what Andy's giving you, Okay, so we'll pick an example. And what the reason I pick cohesion is not um, is because it's fundamental to most of behaviour. But cohesion is a very um, comprehensively researched area. Um, we're, do, we're using it in, as your part of your assignment because because of that, in essence. And the uh, the author of the group environment questionnaire is someone called Albert Caron, who was one of my PhD supervisors back in the day, as my daughter would say. Uh, and it and has has put 30 years into this, and would, is. So passionate about the, the role of teams in, in so many different areas that it's, it's, uh, you get inspired by people such as that. So, if we wanted, to, how do we develop a successful team? We could look at a successful team in different ways to begin with. This brings them like the way of our conceptualisation. We could have a, a winning team, um, and we've got the, the GB clearly being winning teams, or we could have a happy team. Some of that team that works together socialises and there's our happy team together all hugging and stuff like that. Or we might have someone who is in that team and we have an angry member. Now, Chris, when he'll be doing cohesion, will be um, going through this. But when you want to assess something, you need a definition. And... Unfortunately, with psychology, you think, oh, definition, you'll get a definition. Um, the, uh, there's hundreds of them. Most concepts, there are multiple, multiple, multiple definitions. And it, that does not make it easy. Um, the, the option then to pick at this stage would be, to, it would, would be to look at the one that has the greatest utility. What has been used the most? And what... And, as it's been used the most, it will be the most critiqued. There will always be levels of crit- criticism in there. And you'll see lots of criticism, crit- criticism of the group environment questionnaire and cohesion. But there's also comebacks to that. So there's a rich literature which argues the pros and cons, and you can see how that has unravelled over time. Um, the GEQ, Group Environment Questionnaire, is a good example of how you developed a theory and then developed a measure to test that theory. And it's, a, there are, it's not done enough, really, in sports psychology, where someone's developed the theory and then alongside that development has produced the measures for, for, the follow, for, for the rest of the research community to be able to test some of those hypotheses. Often we get a theory, but then you don't have the measures to test that theory with, the, with, with any degree of accuracy. And that therefore future researchers, practitioners are somewhat um, left to their own devices to some degree. So we get um, four different segments to this, which break down into two large areas. 
One is the test. Are we, a co well, are we cohesive in terms of the test? Are, do, do, we, do we want to win in this competition? Do we want to perform our best in this competition? Is being, a, being in this group about a sense of achieving the test? The other is a degree of there's a social aspect to it. Is, is my reason to be part of this group largely social? Nice, simple concepts, four simple concepts. Someone could be high in, um, their, be high in the uh, group part, but not in the social part. They could be high in the social part and not in the group part. So a single sum might be a bit misleading. We have two people, one high in task, one high in social, the other high in social, the other high in task. Massively different, but with the same, could, you could have the same number from the questionnaire to represent them. Misleading. So, that's the GEQ, you can't see that, but it's embedded in there, but we don't, we'll get to that in a minute. I hope that this will work. Let's just... It will work, good. Uh, so what I just thought I'd illustrate by the screen, is just how easy it is to get questionnaires. Because you often quite can't find them, you think, oh, I can't find them. I get lots of emails saying, yeah, can you send me the questionnaire? And I had this not just, not from students, but from other researchers around the world. Uh, and, because I've developed a few questionnaires, partly, but you, you just think, as you'll see here, why don't they just go and find it themselves? Because um, this is live, so this is me typing, and you can, it's about two minutes this is, and then we end up with a GQ. Right? It's not a, a magic exercise. And there's nothing overly clever about what's going on to do this. But we say, OK, we want to measure the GEQ. We know we're going to measure the group environment questionnaire. The task we're trying to get to is um, get a version of the GEQ. So really, how do we do that? Uh, so there's lots of... You can go to the <coughs> test manual, but it's not in our library. It's a bit of a blow. Uh, we didn't need that anyway, really, so I checked that out. We'll, 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 I'll take you through the normal academic routes of sports, discus, and stuff like that. But there's a much simpler version, as we'll get to any second. I can't read that, Andy. What are you actually doing? Well, it, just, it simply types up the um, process we want to do to go and get the GEQ. Okay. Uh, how do we get hold of it? And it'll show us in a minute. Just, what I didn't want to do is be faffing around on the internet in case the internet didn't work. So I filmed it when it would. Try and take some of the uh, computer stress out. <coughs> Given the frequency I'm asked for this, I just thought I'd spell it out. And you just get it from Google. So we we'll go to Google. <laughs> Could have said that easily on the start, but it's, uh, I have to go to Google. <coughs> so we type in group, in group environment question, GEQ, and you can already see, I've done it before, so it's sort of been primed, but there's lots of different options to go to. Well, what you're looking for is and you can explore all of them. Some of them will be some of them will be articles. All of them will be relevant. But you're looking for someone who has put the, the manual how to put how to score the questionnaire, and we get that from this what the one I picked, which is one of the second one along or something. But all questionnaires you'd follow the same sort of route. You just interrogate them. So it tells you the GEQ. It then goes through it. What items you have to add together, and there and then it goes through the questionnaire. And they're all, they're, all those items are there. This is in PDF, I think. But if you wanted to use it, you just copy and paste it, or you just retype it out how you want to. How you want to. Okay, that, you can, that's enough of that. That's too exciting to look at. Okay, so then what? Um, then what we have is. The Excel sheet that I've put together, there's three, there's three sheets to this. One is the GEQ, the same thing. 
The next is each item, which I'll tell you what I'll do. We'll do it live because it's um, it's just as easy to do that if I can find wool, so that you can see where it is. So this is what I mean. It's in wolf. Always with the strain, we never know never what's coming. Here it comes. <laughs> so, three sheets. First one, in essence, from the hard copy I took, copied the GQ over. <coughs> so, question one, I do not enjoy being part of social activities of this team. Strongly disagree for one, strongly agree for nine. So, you'd think about any team you'd, you'd be in, and you'd give a score from one to nine. Tricky thing is, is if you're not sort of disagreeing, not sort of agreeing, you've got four, five and six in the middle scores to play around with your range. Um, you can see how that works. What we have on the second sheet is a bit more involved. And what I've done here is, so that we can score it, put the GEQ for the first nine questions, and then the, sorry, all the 18 questions, Put how it's scored down below there, and what Excel will do, we'll just add them up and divide by four. Yeah. So I've done the, in essence, what I've done is take those scores here and added them up for each factor score, which is which is exactly what you need to do for the score of question there, and I've divided them by four so that the they are all from one to nine. And the reason for one to nine, it means that we can go from strongly agree to strongly disagree. So if it's nine, someone's, they are very strong in their agreement. If it's one, they're strong in their disagreement. We get a rough score of the agreement, disagreement in terms of whether they're high in task, high in, in, social, in social cohesion. Beside that is, is, a, is a graph which shows your scores. So if we pick that up and put that there. So if we put a 9 down, you see what happens is the scores start changing. So the job for the, the afternoon, the job for the seminar, the job for next week is to start interrogating this questionnaire. The job for your assignment is to interrogate this questionnaire. Uh, in other words, we're starting on that process right now. The, in terms of, of then reading about it, it's going, okay, well let's look at the, and, or I'm starting to unpack it. So I've put the, how the items are added together, but you've got that from the other sheet. So you can go two, items two, four, six, and eight. But I'm not happy, I'm happy with my, I'm not, I'm not happy with the amount of playing time I get, I'm happy with my team's level of desire to win. And you can say, well, do those, you could start saying to yourself, do those items appear to be assessing the same concept? Are those items easy to understand? When I put my score down from one to nine, was I fooled by the reverse scoring aspect of it? Because the difficult part of setting this up for me was the reverse scoring part, because I suddenly when I started looking at the questions, I thought, oh, is that meant to be like that? Is that added up the right way around? And you get slightly confused about where you're meant you know, if you're very want to get a very high score on this, whether that's a low, a one, or a nine, when you don't give it enough time. <coughs> so this questionnaire requires the person to have some thinking for each question, which some in some sporting situations, if you were taking this to a group of people before an aerobics class, and you said, okay, you'll always turn up on a Tuesday morning, you're a really, very really cohesive group. Let's just take an assessment of your group cohesion. If they're in a sort of rushed mindset, they could easily misunderstand, misread some of the questions on this questionnaire, which would cause some degrees of, 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 of issues, really, with the, uh, with, uh, the subsequent scores you're going to get. 
So you need to be very mindful of, of how you go there. What you're going to do is, is it, when I finished, in between that and this afternoon, is to go away, there'll be enough time, open this up, play around with it, so that when we come to discuss what these scores are, the, for, the forum part, you understand what you need to do for that. And that will be setting itself up for what we need to do in the assessment four weeks' time. Uh, the third bit of this sheet is data from a group, a, a team, and you can start looking at how that works together in terms of um, some of the issues that are going on with there. You've got a, a, we've got some group data from a team, ten players, forwards, back, and we'll see, you can look at how that works. That might be quite relevant. Third objective, this is dead, dead dry, this, I'm sorry. Dead, dead dry. Um, it's hard to get this jazzed up. It's on validity. The questionnaire you've just seen, and the questionnaires you have seen before, you go, oh, they look simple. And when you think, oh, some of those items look a bit awkwardly worded, some of those items look very similar to each other. Um, the... You, you won't wonder, well, you think, wonder how they got, um, how they supposedly went through so many stages. But most of them have been through a great long list of stages content, face, factorial, criterion, test, test, retest, internal consistency, and normative data. That sounds awfully complicated. What we'll do is we'll go through some of those because they, some knowledge of these things gives a way to criticise or comment on or offer some of the limitations in questionnaires if they haven't got one of these stages done that comprehensively. Because the process of validating a questionnaire is one that never ends. You never say, oh, it's now valid. It's, they are, um, it's an ongoing process in that the next study, in essence, tests its validity because of the, estimate, the estimated nature of the concept that you've got. You've never got a tape measure to measure a table. You've never got anything as accurate as that. You've got a whole series of best guesses. And they sometimes work in different situations not to not work so well in others. So, oh, here we go again. Content validity. Very factual. What this means is that when you want to start a questionnaire, you need to get the number of different questions that assess the concept that you want. Often the way of doing that is to get a group of experts we go, okay, we want, we want to develop a questionnaire on anxiety. So we'll think, think of all the different ways to describe anxiety as possible. And we'll, we'll start by having saying, that is our item pool. If we have a question on anxiety <coughs> and a question on habits of training, because it, one gets thrown in there, the habits of training question isn't actually assessing the content that you, that you want, that you're, that you're hopefully... Assess it, make, you, you're developing your questionnaire to assess. So it's about getting the questions that assess the content that's valid for the area. The, what you, you need to look for in studies is whether this has been done or not. And it's often done with a group of experts. Sometimes it's done with a group of participants or both. Um, I thought when the questionnaires we've done is I quite like to start with the people who are likely to use this right from the starting point, which is brings up, and that content validity develops with face validity, in that uh, can people understand what this, what, can you understand what these questions are supposed to be saying? That's the bottom line to that. Uh, we validated a mood measure, again back in the day, as it was, and we had, one of the items was designed to assess depression, and it was, do you feel sad? Why do you feel sad? Do you feel sad? That seems to assess depression. No, I sad. Um, and there, there didn't seem to be anything potentially problematic to that until I was collecting data on school children when I was a school teacher. Uh, and the comment from one of the kids was, 
X has to put 4 down for sad because he's sad. And you think, ah, oh, what we have now is um, an item that is now very misinterpreted by that 14-year-old um, group. They would all be in their 30s now. Um, who are interpreting that item in a very different way that's intended. So if people are thinking, do you feel, uh, do you feel sad? They might be, do you feel cool? So the, if some people are putting three down for feeling de depressed, three down for unhappy, and zero for sad, sad is being misinterpreted because it's not lining up in the same way with those other items. So sad got dropped because it was causing trouble. But that is quite a neat way of doing it. So you simply take the questionnaire, give it to the group, and say, do these questions assess what you expect them to do? We, um, I've done this with, with other questionnaires. There's a, an eating attitudes test, which um, was valid, validated on a clinical population. And one of the questions, or, or one of the questions is, do you avoid foods with a high carbohydrate content? Um, well now, for someone with a clinic with an eating disorder, that is an answer is an affirmative yes. Um, uh, so the question was, do you know the do you know the um, do you know food which, do you know which foods have a high carbohydrate content? And the idea that you're obsessive about your foods uh, and therefore you, you you study them in detail. For many athletes, see, that's absolutely fundamental to know what foods have a high carbohydrate. So they'll score high on that. And we were getting scores on the eating attitudes test, which would put athletes borderline potential clinical um, issue, where the majority of their variance in their scores, and this went all high scores for items which were about the knowledge of content of foods. Well, that, you could tell that is still an over-obsession with foods, but it's very understandable from athletes who have to make weights have to perform in endurance events where nutrition is, is where they're going, where they're having nutrition lectures and in information on one hand from their coaches. It's not necessarily an eating disorder. So, in other words, you ask athletes, or you ask people what they understand by that, and you get a very, very different concept coming back to you, and it's then explained in, in their language, which is why sometimes that this process is vital for understanding the the. Um, Validity of a questionnaire. Oh, oops, that's gone off. That's a bit odd. The uh, there's not enough studies of face validity, um, and if you are doing the, it's one of the stages which can be done, which doesn't require death by statistics. All the others require quite a lot of advanced, sophisticated statistics. And they're a bit off-putting. You'll read them, you go, oh, I don't know what that means, and that's fair enough, and I don't blame you. But this one is, is a, do, does your participant group understand the meaning of the items? Any study you do, dissertations, taking a section of people, asking if they understand the questions, and having that check can only be a plus to your study, because it's a check on whether your question, questionnaire is assessing what you want, to, what, what you want it to do. Every, taking the point, and you build this into all your writing, that every questionnaire is going to be an estimate, all going to have er errors in it, then um, you're trying to understand where those errors come from. And that's, that is of, that's, that's better than saying it's valid, it's perfect, the scores are fine, it's the, the garden is rosy. Because questionnaires give you estimates. It's potentially dirty data, potentially social desirable data. People saying that they're better than what they are, different to how they're truly feeling. You've just got to try and understand where those where that is coming from in your group. Ask you a simple way of doing it. This one is death by stats, I'm afraid. You know when I said you add up the items? Well, you add up the items as a consequence of someone doing factor analyses. And what you're looking for there is someone to have gone out and collected hundreds of questionnaires on the participant group that is being studied on. Um, factorial validity is simply saying, using a statistical test, say, the large, number, the large numbers of people agree that four items for tension equal tension in the best way possible, with me measurement error minimised. 
You don't have to do a factor analysis. It just chucks out. You want to see SPSS go on a factor analysis. It loves it. It just keeps throwing out the stuff it does. You have to, you have to click a whole load of buttons on, on SPSS to tell it to calm down. To, 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 no, you don't want to be done. Um, what you need, what you, the take up part of this is that factor analysis is used to determine how the factors are added together. Test retest reliability, also vital, often not done. When you're looking for test retest reliability, what, you, what the starting point is, is this concept supposed to be stable? If it's not, then you don't need test retest reliability, because you need to understand what that's going to be. Te it's the set of scales I talked about earlier. Test re um, a set of scales can be reliable, you get the same score twice, but people can do things in the middle, go on a diet or go and have, it, have excessive Christmases. Uh, and the weight can go up and down, put a big coat on, big heavy shoes on. Um, if you're wearing the same clothes, you weigh yourself, two minutes later you should have the same scores. My set of scale at home are not like that. You can lean back on them and you get two pounds lighter. You lean forward on them, you get a bit heavier. So your weight is dependent on how you angle your body. Uh, I tell you, cheers my wife up no end once she's worked the technique. technique. Uh, the, and quite a few scales are like that. Um, have a little bit of variation in them. So it's, it's worth knowing measurement error. It's worth knowing the test, retest, measurement error. It's what's also worth pointing to the physiologist to find out what their test, retest, uh, measurement error is. And we did a study which looked at uh, theory on self-control, which, which said that self-control uses glucose. And we looked at the studies that had done this and then we said, well, hold on, the amount of change in the glucose is only a little from mental processes using glucose. And then we found out that the, the, um, the amount of change that the authors were reporting was smaller than the measurement error in the equipment that was gathering it. So the glucose thing for a diabetic will give a measurement error of this much, but the change the authors were reporting was smaller than that. So... You, can you confidently say that those changes have gone in the direction? You can say that they are statistically significant, but you don't know whether that's a product of the, of the error measurement in the kit going your way on 30 people. So it causes a bit of a... It, it's worth knowing the retest, retest reliability in lots and lots of different ways. Alan Neville and I, in the good old days, when and we did this with students, did a test, retest reliability of a questionnaire, and we used a really simple method that was simply said if you score a four one week, you should score a four the next, the next, four the next week. However, given that we accept that some people might be nearer five or nearer three, so if you're nearer three one week and you put a four down, you put a three the next week, then that's pretty much okay. It's rough. But 90% of people have got to come within plus and minus one in order for us to give a, a figure for, um, um, to say that's acceptable. Of which 90% people say, well, where do you get 90% from? Which throws up the other part, which is worth knowing as a researcher, that statistical significance, point less than 05. Has anyone ever said where that comes from? Because they, they don't know. It's like a magical figure that's been conjured up, that this is what's well, got to be lower than. If your study is 0.06, that's not significant. If 0.05, it is significant. Uh, and it's, you know, I've, you know the, the, I've seen heads go down at 0.06 as if, oh, it's failed. Um, they're arbitrary. They're selected. Arbitrary numbers selected. Um, 0.05 is the most commonly accepted one, but it's worth knowing that they are arbitrary to some degree and there's some construction of that by people to say that's not the most preferred. It's not, they're not set in stones, that is a point. Um, but if, if you've got 0.06 and you wanted to get 0.05, you could fix that by straight like that. You'd fix it immediately. You wouldn't have to do any sort of jiggery pokery with your stats. You'd just set a one directional hypothesis and it all immediately becomes significant. Immediately. You just lost. Oh no, I don't. but I'm just saying. But I'm just saying. I've just made another arbitrary decision to change the result. 
That's all. I'm stopping you anyway. And another part, the final part, which sport questionnaires don't get often enough, is having normative data to which you compare your, your data on. Uh, and there's a questionnaire called the Profile of Mood States, which was used extensively in the 70s and 80s. Peter Terry and I collected quite a bit of data on this um, in our Brunel days, um, about 2,000 people. And there was this theory that you, this iceberg profile was one associated with good performance. But from our normative data of athletes, 2,000 of them, it said, well, the iceberg's normal. An athlete reporting an iceberg is the normal profile. So if you report anything different than an iceberg, you are below what is average for an athlete. And athlete norms are, are higher in positive emotions than, or pleasant emotions than student norms, which the first set of people are going on. So that offers a little bit of insight. So my summary, and I have finished on time beautifully, um, is that be aware that there are weaknesses in all self-report questionnaires. Self-report questionnaires are useful, but you do need to interrogate their limitations. And one way of doing that in any study you do would be a face validity study as a pilot study. You don't need many people, but you ask them, what do you think of these questions? Is this assessing this? And you do some degree of discussion with them to try and work out, will it assess what it wants to? Because it gives you an understanding of where the measurement error may come. Except there's always errors in measurement. Someone might not know what they put, might genuinely not how they're fe feeling, how cohesive they are, how happy they are. From one to seven, one, zero to four, there may be a four or maybe a three. If this was a perfect science, which predicted perfectly, it would, you'd always get the right score every time, but people aren't like that. They make a best case decision on, how they're, on what's in their mind at the moment, and what's in their mind at the moment is influenced by lots of things. Uh, and there's, there's some great work on the effects of mood on recall of information, that you make someone grumpy. They're very good at recalling information related to being grumpy. So the, the mood itself primes the memory processes. Okay, what you need to do, the worksheet and the groups going on there after this, is, which is where the rest of the work goes on. So what I'll do is I'll waz through, I'll go, waz through, that. no one uses that sort of language anymore. I'll go through that, uh, the... Um, the, I'll go. Through, I'll open it up just to show you what it is, um, so that um, you can you can see. It also allows me to see if it actually works. Okay, right, what we do is open this up. This here is this article, which should, as I open it up, da 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 da, that was absolutely fantastic, that works. So, embedded in this thing is the article Developing and Validated Psychometric Tests in High Performance Settings. And it just goes through largely what I've been saying there today, but um, because it's written down, it sounds much better than I usually say it. And then your task is to open the Excel file, which is in questionnaires. The instructions which you saw, well, if you can't do it, are, are loaded up via that YouTube link. And then you complete the, the sheet rate your own perceived cohesion, which is that one there. So there's the, the first is the questionnaire, which have a look at, which is pasted from the internet. This is the constructed one. Uh, it's worth looking through how things are added up together. As you put scores in, you can scroll down, it produces your graph. And then as you put your scores in, in line with high, middle and low, you can see where your scores are being compared against. And you just need to play around with that. If I was in a cohesive team, how would I score this? 
you could think back to situations where you and you did, this, this is playing around with data, playing around with data. It's not, you're not get, don't give your inner thoughts into this in, um, and give it publicly if you don't want to. Just playing around with data. Imagine you're in the, imagine you're in a soccer team that lost last night, or you could be you, a Man City fan. You could be a Man City fan, yeah. wondering. What, how on earth are you going to survive on 200,000 a week? <laughs> I'm not getting out of bed for anything more than that. And so on. Uh, the 200 million pound Man City team that lost against Aston Villa's reserves the other night, wasn't it? <laughs> I thought it was funny. And then Man Mancini's comments were funny, yeah. So this is all set up for them to actually put in their own data. That they just play around with that and then... Well, this is your work for later, so you okay. need to know what you're doing. And then, in the course cafe, not really a cafe, is almost instructions there again. And the, some prompts, does the question score seem correct? Did it tell you anything about your sense of cohesion that you didn't know already? Were any items really awkward? Would you trust the GAQ to measure your team? If not, what else would you do? And I put a very short comment there. But what we want is 80 comments. Some can be long. You can comment on each other, um, which will unravel this. And then next, start of next lesson, when Tracy, I'll go through your comments and we'll see what the issues were. No, not, not issues, issues in a bad way, but... What insights you've given to this? Because you're, this will be fresh to you. It's, it's been presented as this is the best way of doing it. But you might have some really good ideas to say, actually, I don't think it's the best way of doing this what's at all. I would do it this way. And now you, can, you, could, you could say these in, at this point. You could certainly criticise the GEQ. And, um, and by, going over it next, by going over these comments next week, the, aim, the idea is to say these were good comments. These were comments which were a bit wary. These comments would be brilliant if you found a reference to support them, and this is where the references were found. These comments, which are a bit leery, are, would be brilliant if you've got a reference to them, because other people have said this, and therefore you're constructing that. So what, in essence, what I'm trying to do by doing this is getting you into playing with the questionnaire scores, which is get you out of the dry stuff. Um, and this is a great demo for demo run for what we're doing in the assignment, which is unpacking this questionnaire in a bit more detail and start testing out what your ideas are against interpreting these. Except that there's error in there. The idea that this is a perfect measure, everything works quite well, isn't the answer. It's, it's where, it can, where it may be misinterpreted. Where it may be particularly good is worth putting in there. But do these items add with these items in the best way possible? Are there other ways of doing it? Um, you could even look if there are other, other measures of cohesion that you might prefer to, to look at. There's collective self-efficacy, which is a nice constant way of looking at cohesion as well, which you've not put into. But there are just there are there's lots of different ways of going at this. To start with, we're just simply playing around with the scores and seeing what goes on. And the, two, the, the afternoon is in essence for that. You've got quite a bit of time to play around with this, read all this, read the article. There should there was the, this lecture. I, I rather cheatingly did it from something else, but I can't see. I, I wrote an article for a general public sort of thing, in, which was a science magazine, and the lecture's the same, really, but it's flowerier words. Not the same in a bad way, but the same in that there's an, there's an article which supplies in a little more elaborate terms. That's quite a lot to do, actually. That's quite a lot to do, because that's the way you learn, I'm afraid. And this is quite dry, unfortunately, to go and... To go and exciting over factorial validity. Rarely, rarely, as some of I said about factor analysis, has someone run out of the room and gone and done one. Not happened very often. I would do the BBC test as well. That's another thing. To, but you do, you can, um, I'm not sure. If you did that soon, I'd know whether they work on these computers that's at the university. 100,000 have done it. You're, not, you're doing it for your own benefit, not, not necessarily for us. I have... We have taken instalment of the first 55,000 cases. Sheffield are busy beavering away at that, to analysing that. And by the time I come back to talk about that project later on in this module, we may have some results, we may not have some results, but we may have some. But I've still got a lot to say on it. 
Um, so the link to that is, is that the start yeah, of the lecture? Again? Start of the lecture. But it's yeah. be, you, you could be, if you just wrote, um, can you compete Michael Johnson, it was that to the, uh, that to the um, page without too much trouble by Google. So, okay? So you two, two hours this afternoon. If they have a problem, are they going to 201? We've got that. Question. 201, is it? 201, yeah. 201. Yeah. If, you, if you're struggling with knowing what to do for this afternoon, which is at 12 till 2, you can come along to WN201. Do, are you. That's, That's where you were going to be there. Yeah. And Andy will be there to, to um, help you out, just to go over anything you need to do. But, but everything is on there for you. If you go into the week one, <laughs> model introduction I've done. Shh, thank you. How can you measure? And you actually play around with that data. And then you, once you've played around and understood it and gone through the aspects of the GQ that are there for you, looked at it. Because what we're doing is trying to get in the habit of not just taking it as read, that the questionnaire must be all that it intends to be. Yeah, you've got to look at the questionnaire and be able to critique it, be able to look at what the problems are with it, what's good, what's bad. And that's all the questions that are...